I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. It's important to our planet. It is important for the world. We got here and discovered we had a technical snafu, um, and uh, even when we thought we had that fixed, it still didn't work, so uh, we're t going with the, uh, the backup plan here, and for this particular presentation, I need, uh, I need to be able to show you things and play things for you and stuff like that, so uh, just had to, had to have it, and for some reason... Uh, Traffic doesn't move really fast around here. I'm not really sure what that's all about, but uh, uh, I guess it moves at Hawaiian time and Hawaiian speed. And uh, so it took us, took us quite some time to uh, get back to the hotel and get stuff, but we're here and I will do my best to uh, get us back on, uh, on time by talking really, really fast. Uh, obviously, I'm very impressed that you're here on a Saturday morning. Uh, there's uh, lots of things you could be doing, but hopefully, over this time, I'll be able to uh, get your interest going. Uh, we didn't actually arrange, I don't think we really thought it would necessarily be available, but we didn't actually arrange to have my new book here. Uh, maybe Shane would be kind enough to hold it up at some point and show people. And, and uh, uh, I do have a new book called uh, What Every Christian Needs to Know About the Quran that will uh, be a good follow-up to this presentation. This is the first time I've actually spoken on the subject since the book came out. so. Uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, there it is now, yes. Uh, do, can you do the Vanna White thing? Uh, there you go, all right. Uh, thank you. Uh, surprised that I ever uh, did this. Uh, this would never have crossed my mind when I first started studying uh, apologetics that this would be an area that I would be getting into. Uh, it's not because of 9-11. Honestly, I began studying Islam because I was studying the persecuted church. And you cannot study the persecuted church without encountering the subject of Islam in our world today. And as I have dealt with the issue and hopefully continue to grow in my understanding of it, I, I think starting studying a world religion this late in life means I will always be a student thereof, certainly never an expert therein because there's so much to know and uh, so much background information. But I am absolutely convinced that a massive chasm exists between our two communities. How many of you here have read the Quran? What was that? Did you raise your hand? I always get somebody that says, parts, you know, and, uh, you know, a little bit, you know. Um, how, did you read it in Arabic? No, okay, so uh, from, the, uh, from the Islamic perspective, no one here, including myself, has actually read the Quran because the Quran only exists in Arabic. Uh, you may read a translation of the Quran, but that's not actually the Quran. Now, remember that only 16 to 19 percent of the world's Muslims are themselves Arabic. Um, the largest Muslim country in the world is, of course, Indonesia. And so the vast majority of Muslims, from their own perspective, have actually never read the Quran in its original language. And if you were a group of Muslims, and I were to be asking them, how many of you have read the Bible, uh, the percentages would be about identical as to how many of them have read the Bible. That means we don't, almost everything we know about each other's faith, we know from what we were told by someone else. And what's the major source of information for most evangelicals on Islam? Fox News, uh, which is better than MSNBC, uh, significantly better than MSNBC, but it's still Fox News. And that means, and unfortunately for most, uh, for most Muslims, it's the exact same kind of thing. I have a uh, there's a Muslim scholar that I've gotten to know a little bit and he will contact me sometimes and he'll say, what's the difference between this group and this group? 
Because put yourself in their shoes, looking at us, it would be a bewildering thing to try to figure out, well, what's the difference between a charismatic and a Baptist and a Presbyterian and an Eastern Orthodox? And especially when you end up with charismatic Catholics, you know, or, or something like that. You start getting the mixtures together and it's very, very difficult for them to understand where we're coming from and all the differences that we have. And we know, I bet you most of you in here, what are the, what are the two major uh, sects of, of Islam? Sunni and Shia. Sunni and Shia. Uh, most of us have heard that. How many of you have heard of the Druze? How about the Ahmadi? See, uh, again, there are smaller groups. But why do the Sunnis blow up the Shiites and the Shiites blow up the Sunnis? Uh, these are all issues that go way, way, way back. And by the way, they're issues that no amount of travel by Hillary Clinton or John Kerry will ever solve, I assure you, uh, given they've been going on for 1,400 stinking years so far. Um, these, these differences are lost on most of us. And then even amongst the Sunni, there are all sorts of different groups. You have the Salafi or the Wahhabi, which we hear about in Saudi Arabia and in Egypt. Uh, the Salafi would in essence be the fundamentalist uh, uh, Muslims. But then you have folks who live here and they haven't come from another country and they're, they're not nearly as conservative in certain areas. They have different views and things. So there's all sorts of different perspectives out there. The, the result is we normally are talking past each other. We have difficulty communicating with one another because we're talking past each other because we don't know much about each other's communities. The result of that, my friends, is that most of us fear addressing a Muslim. I mean, let's be honest. If, if I were to ask you, if, if you're sitting on, a, on an aircraft and you got stuck in the middle seat, sorry about that, uh, those of us who have frequent flyer miles, we're very sorry about the fact you get stuck in the middle seat. Um, but we don't care because we don't end up there anyways. But, um, and you've got a secularist on the aisle and a Muslim at the window. Which one are you going to be more likely to talk to? Probably the secularist because you're concerned. You might have valid concerns about doing something that's offensive to the Muslim because you don't know what necessarily offends Muslims, but you do have a vague idea that Muslims can be rather easily offended. Um, and you're just not used to the, those issues there. There's a fear. There's a fear, and if we have a fear, then we will very frequently hesitate, and hesitation frequently results in the inability to actually end up bearing testimony. And so what I, what I want to try to do in the time we have together is to just... Uh, sort of get you thinking, give you some foundation, and hopefully challenge you to think about really praying for the Muslim people. One of the greatest things that, that the Lord has allowed me to do over the past about year, year and a half or so, is to develop some friendships with some of the men that I debate. That's pretty unusual. Um, that's resulted in some, uh, some very interesting insights from my perspective. And it's helped me certainly to be, I think, a, more, a better representative of Christ to these individuals. Uh, most of us don't know many Muslims, or we only have very brief interaction with them. And because there's often very deep cultural differences, we, we tend to be very standoffish. Hopefully, I'll be able to help you to understand the Islamic mindset and at least help to, help to get you a little bit more prepared if you have the opportunity. Beyond all of that, you might say, well, I'm just not sure there are that many Muslims in Hawaii, for crying out loud. Well, okay. Um, do you watch the news? Are you influenced by world events? Um, do you wonder why it's so dangerous that someone like Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is getting nuclear weapons? Um, we, we, as Christians, want to interact with what's going on in the world from a Christian worldview. And in the process, um, we need to know something about Islam. It, it, my grandparents didn't know much about Islam, and it probably didn't have much impact on them. We don't live in a world like that anymore. We don't world, live in a world. So I, I would challenge you to listen very, uh, very carefully. And by the way, I've just got to say this. Did you know, sir, that you look very much like George Bush? 
every time I, I every time I just scan through the audience, I go, man, we've got we've got one of the former presidents of the United States amongst us. So, uh, <laughs> well, you know, he might just be hiding out in Hawaii for a while. You know. Uh, this is great, you know, I, I, I ditched my Secret Service agents at Waikiki Beach, and here I am at Central Baptist. So uh, I just had to say that. It just, uh, uh, nothing personal intended, has nothing to do with politics, it just looked like George Bush to me. Anyhow, um, you need to understand the five pillars of Islam. Now, I will primarily be addressing Sunni Islam because you have about a 90% chance of running into a Sunni Muslim. Uh, the, the percentages are about 90%, 10%. Uh, as far as uh, Sunni, Shia, actually it's about 88%, 10%, and then you've got some very interesting groups in the, in the middle, like the, I've mentioned the Ahmadi Muslims and, and people like that. The Ahmadi, by the way, from a Sunni perspective, would, to, to sort of give you a parallel, would be like Jehovah's Witnesses are to us. Okay? I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses say they're Christians, but we would say they're not because they deny fundamental definitional aspects of the faith. In the same way, the Ahmadi have had a prophet after Muhammad. So from the Sunni perspective, right out. Even though they have the Quran, they do the five daily prayers, etc., etc., etc. So the five pillars of Islam. The first is the Shahada. Now let me ask, uh, of the Christians who are here, assuming that most people here are Christians, uh, how many of you made your profession of faith in either Biblical Hebrew or Koine Greek? Anyone? No? Really? That's shocking to me. Actually, I've never had anyone say yes, even when I've been lecturing at seminaries, which had me a little worried that some of the professors might go, well, I did, that type of thing. But the Shahada is the statement that there is only one true God or one God worthy of worship, Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. But you can say that until you're blue in the face in English, Spanish, French, German, Hawaiian, uh, if you could even come up with commensurate terms in Hawaiian, uh, and it will make absolutely no difference whatsoever. To make a proper shahada, which is how you become a Muslim, you have to say it in Arabic. Um, so you have to be led through it pretty much syllable by syllable by someone who knows how to say la ilaha illallah wa Muhammad Rasulullah. And so they, they take you through that slowly, and then you, then you say ashadu, I confess that, and then you you repeat that again. How many of you have ever seen someone become a Muslim? Okay. I, I really enjoy showing this because it bothers most Christians to no end. Now you say, see, I've, I've heard that about you. you. You like doing that. But it makes people wake up and realize what's going on. Um, this video is from a seminar that took place in Sydney, Australia. One of the primary reasons I chose it, other than clarity, uh, is when I first started studying Islam, I would be listening to videos by men like Zakir Naik and Ahmed Didad and people like that, and, and I would say to my, my dear, patient, loving wife, who some of you got to meet uh, last year when, when she got to come out with me, um, hey, hey, Cal, listen, listen to what Didat says here, and I'd fire something up on my computer, and she'd stand there for about 10 seconds, and then she'd look at me and go, have any idea what he's saying. Because many of them are from another country, they have an accent, she just couldn't even begin to follow and she'd wander off. Well, this guy, his name is Khalid Yasim, is from Brooklyn. So, fairly easy to understand. And what he's done, I've, I've obviously listened to the entire, entirety of his presentation, is he's spent a couple days presenting Islam, but primarily in an anti-Christian fashion. He has made incredible errors uh, concerning uh, the Bible, the history of the Christian church, uh, just all sorts of things. I mean, it's just horrible information. But this is basically an Islamic altar call. This is calling people for, this took place in Sydney. In fact, I had the opportunity of lecturing at Moore College uh, a couple of years ago, and some of the students in the class I was teaching had actually been at this uh, themselves. And so this is taking place in a Western culture, and he's calling people forward to become Muslims. So let's, uh, let's watch as people become Muslims. Can you stand for me quickly? Just stand for me. Come right here, please. Well, that's not working. 
Never had this happen before. DGA works fine, HDMI not so much. Well, just listen, I guess. I apologize. First, first time for everything. What? I want to make this. Uh... I, I can't. Uh, I, I, I suppose I could try to play it in a, in a but it's playing in keynote, and I, I've just never, it's just never ever had an issue. Can you stand for me quickly? Just stand for me. Come right here, please. I want to make this. Uh, I want to make this transition or this transaction, because this is what it is. These are human beings that's making a transaction with God. They're not making a transaction for us. They're making a transaction with God and a transition in their lives. So I want to make this easy for them. We have a gift for them, and we're going to give them this gift. Now the gift that we're giving to them is something that will help them on their way. One, it's a copy of the Qur'an with the transliteration of the meanings. Secondly, it's a short, easy to read, authentic biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. Thirdly, it is a set of seven books It is a set of seven books that have in it lessons for new Muslims. Now, your acceptance of Islam is your acceptance of God, not your acceptance of me, or not your acceptance of these people, nor your acceptance of the political dynamics in the world, because it has nothing to do with that. It's just your acceptance of God. And this gift is to help you make that trans transition. I want you to say with me the simple words. And these words are nothing more than what I have explained. There's no trick, no curve, and we don't have a pool in the back for you to dip in. <laughs> but let's say the words. Let's just go over the words called the Shahada the bearing of witness. And I'll tell you what it is, essentially it is the saying of that there's none to be worshipped except Almighty God and that Muhammad is the messenger of God. Saying that word and then adding to it, I testify or I declare or I announce that there's none to be worshipped except Almighty God and that I testify or I declare or I announce that Muhammad is the messenger of God brings you or into the transition of Islam. From that point, it's your sincerity, it's your acts of worship, it is your commitment that will make the difference. Now whatever you owe God of something you did that only you know and God knows, after tonight, your board is clear. Because God is the forgiver of those that come back to Him. But whatever you owe somebody, money, rent, a loan, you still owe that. Is that fair? Okay, please, just say after me the words La La Ilaha Illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Ashhadu An La Ilaha إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده عبده 
ورسول صلى الله عليه وسلم آمين Well, at least now you have heard uh, people becoming, uh, becoming Muslim. I apologize for that. That's one thing we didn't test. And uh, again, not sure why that's, that's happening. Obviously, there's some conflict between the systems. But anyways, as you see, they had to be taken through the saying of the Shahada, uh, syllable by syllable. And you know, they didn't know what was actually being said. It had been explained to them. They had to trust him that he was, that's what they were saying. But that is how you say the Shahada. It has to be done publicly. It has to be done in front of witnesses. And that is how you become a, um, a Muslim. I, I think it should, I personally think that I think honesty would, be, would demand that you probably should explain to folks um, that there's no way out of this. That the, uh, the universally accepted Islamic law, Sharia, for a person who becomes a Muslim and then ceases to be a Muslim is death. Um, I remember very briefly one of the uh, television networks did a, uh, a thing with uh, uh, a Muslim family in Dearborn, Michigan. And uh, they showed someone doing the Shahada. And I thought he did it rather lightheartedly, but uh, no one explained to him that this is lifelong. This is it. Um, and uh, the only way out of this is, uh, is rather um, important. Anyway, um, so the first is the Shahada, the first of the five pillars. Uh, when it says there's only one true God, that is an expression of the most important aspect of Islamic theology, which is called Tawheed. Tawheed is the oneness of Allah. If that's the most important, if that's, that is for them what the Trinity is to us. Tawheed, there is only one true God. Now, we, of course, believe there's only one true God as well. They don't think we believe that, but that's another issue we can get to a little bit later on. Uh, but if that's the center of Islam, then the denial of that, idolatry, associating anyone or anything with Allah, is called shirk. And shirk is the unforgivable sin. If you die as a mushrik, a person who dies on the sin of shirk, having committed it and not having become a Muslim to receive forgiveness, Allah cannot forgive you. He can forgive anybody else, but he cannot forgive a person who dies as a mushrik. Uh, that person uh, will have the hellfire for eternity. Then we have number two, the salat, the prayers, the five daily prayers in some, uh, in some Islamic nations. You don't even ask someone, are you a Muslim? You ask them, do you say the prayers? Uh, and that's more than enough to identify you uh, as, as a Muslim. There are five prayers. Uh, Fajr, for example, is before sunrise. Uh, Dur, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha. Isha is, is after sunset. The others are divided through the day, the noontime, afternoon, evening, and nighttime prayers. And uh, I, I have a, a video, but if it's, if it's not going to display, I'm going to skip it. Let me see if it, if it comes up at all or it's just blank. Yeah. Well, it's not even playing, which is really odd. I've never had that happen before either. So we will skip that and uh, move on from there. Um, you also have the concept of Saum or fasting, uh, the month of Ramadan, which you may hear about. Um, I remember I first heard about Ramadan during the NBA Finals. Some of you might remember why that was. Uh, a number of years ago, the Houston Rockets were in the NBA Finals. And uh, who was the, the big star player for the Rockets back then? But Hakeem Olajuwon, a practicing Muslim. And the finals fell during Ramadan. And during Ramadan, the observant Muslim cannot eat or drink from before sunrise until after sunset each day during the month of Ramadan, which is the ninth month in the Islamic calendar. Now, the Islamic calendar is based upon a lunar year. And so that means it's about 11 days shorter than our calendar is each year, which means everything keeps moving forward 11 days. So Ramadan is now in July. Now, can you imagine what it's like to live in Saudi Arabia and not be able to even drink water from before sunrise 
until after sunset. Um, amazing. Uh, but uh, studies have shown, however, that Muslims take in more calories during Ramadan than any other uh, month of the year uh, because you're basically up all night eating. And, uh, uh, but that is the, the month of fasting. And uh, according to Islamic belief, I rarely mention this, but for some reason, uh, we're going to have to skip most of my videos so you get some other extra, extra stories here. Um, there is a special night called Laylat al-Qadr, the night of power. And Muhammad taught that if you, you pray during the night on Laylat al-Qadr, that your prayers will have thousands of times the efficacy that they would have at any other point uh, during the year. And forgiveness of sins and all these things. But Muhammad didn't tell you anybody which night was Laylat al-Qadr. In fact, according to the Hadith, and the Hadith are a collection, a huge collection, of the sayings and actions of Muhammad and his companions. Uh, the Sunni have a, 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 about six collections of Hadith. There's more than that, but that are considered particularly authoritative. The two most authoritative are Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Uh, these are nine and eight volume sets together. Many, many thousands of sayings on many, many different subjects. I've read all of Bukhari. I'm just about done with Muslim. And um, one of the Hadith stories is that Muhammad was about to tell the people exactly which night of Ramadan Laylat al-Qadr was. But when he came out of his house, the Muslims were arguing with each other. And because they were arguing with each other, he was caused to forget which night it was. And so it's the, by other Hadith, it's either the 21st, 23rd, 25th, 27th, or 29th if you can get that far, depending on the, uh, but those odd numbered nights of the month of Ramadan. That's, that's when Laylat al-Qadr is. So many observant Muslims will stay up all night on those nights uh, praying because one of them is Laylat al-Qadr. Uh, that takes place during uh, the month of uh, Ramadan. Then you have what's called zakat, the giving of alms. Uh, in an Islamic context, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but it's 2.5% of anything you possess for more than a year is how it breaks down. Um, that would be given to the Muslim state, but since there aren't, any, there aren't very many states even claimed to be fully compliant with Sharia law, um, people give that to help build mosques and, and things like that. Finally is the Hajj. If you're as old as I am, you remember, you, 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 you knew about Haji. Remember Haji in, um, what was that? Um, Johnny, Quest. Johnny Quest. Thank you very much. You just demonstrated yourself to be a geek. Um, <laughs> uh, between that and saying roll back the thing, uh, the, you, you're, you're obviously an engineer of some kind. Uh, but uh, yes, Johnny Quest had Haji. And a Haji is simply someone who's gone on Hajj, which you're supposed to do at least once during your life. Uh, if you are physically and financially able to do so. Ir the irony is, uh, clearly Muhammad was not looking too far down the road uh, because today, given the number of people that the Saudi Arabian government allows into Mecca and Medina to do the Hajj pilgrimage, if you look at the world's population of Muslims, technically, there's no longer, the, the, the Muslim population is too large to fulfill the fifth pillar of Islam any longer. Even if you wanted to fulfill that fifth pillar, not enough spots are open for all Muslims to do that any longer in the world, which is rather interesting. Uh, I'm going to see if, if this is going to, maybe one will work and one won't. Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca is compulsory for all Muslims in good health and with sufficient funds to make the journey. The Hajj is the foremost of all Muslim rituals, even if less than 10% of all Muslims ever manage to complete it. The Hajj's importance lies in its allowing the believer to approach the center of the world, as well as the place where the Quran's divine revelations began and continued for about 12 years. The performer of Hajj does not only reenact Muhammad's ritual, he or she also recalls acts of important people in Muslim history. The rituals performed around the Kaaba reenacts when Prophet Abraham and Ishmael transformed the Kaaba into the sacred place of worship and peace.
In spite of some physical hardships, pilgrims who complete the Hajj consider it one of the greatest spiritual experiences of their lives. Many Muslims regard the Hajj as one of the great achievements of civilization because it brings together people from around the world and focuses them upon a single goal. So there's uh, that. I don't think that's not going to uh, One of the things, uh, you, you've probably seen the Kaaba. Uh, I don't have pictures of it because it was in the videos, but uh, the Kaaba is the, the house there in the Grand Mosque in, in Mecca, black cube-shaped uh, building. Most people think that uh, Muslims pray toward that specifically. That's actually not the case. The, the Kaaba itself is not sacred. The idea is, from the Islamic perspective, that Abraham and Ishmael, not Abraham and Isaac, Abraham and Ishmael actually built the original Kaaba. Uh, of course, there's no historical evidence that Abraham ever went that far south by any stretch of the imagination uh, to that area, but be that as it may, um, the, 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 the idea was that they built it as the first house of worship to God. And then in the days of Muhammad, there were approximately 360 idols in it. And it was Muhammad who cleansed the Kaaba and, and re returned it to its original purpose of a house of worship of the one true God, uh, founded by the founder of the Abrahamic faith. But the building has been destroyed and rebuilt a number of different times. Um, so it's not actually what Muslims are, are praying toward. Um, you may see Muslims, you, now obviously it's real easy, I even have an app on my phone uh, that allows me to fire it up and it will, it will aim me toward what's called the Qibla. Uh, I should have done this beforehand, but uh, keep track of how many Arabic words I use this morning. You cannot discuss Islam without using Arabic words. I've already talked about Tawheed and Shirk and the Shahada and uh, uh, the, the Muslim prayers and Ramadan, uh, it, it's amazing. You just, it is very, very, very deeply associated with the Arabic, uh, the Arabic language. The Qibla is the direction toward Mecca. And so if you were to go into, do you have uh, mosques nearby? Is there a mosque over near University of Hawaii? There is, there is a mosque over there. If you were to go visit it, uh, you would see that if you go into the prayer room, uh, there is a, it all points toward one area. And it would be pretty tricky to figure out exactly, I wonder if you're closer, which way around the world, I, I would imagine you'd be closer the other way around the world to, uh, to Mecca than in the United States, I would assume. But anyways, they, they figure out the most direct line to Mecca. And that is where they face when they pray, and the architecture of the building, or the room, if, it's, if they can't do anything about the building, the room will be pointed toward that area. Like I said, you now have apps that will allow you to, to figure that out for yourself and see which direction uh, Mecca is from where you are. What they're actually uh, bowing toward is what's in the picture here, and that's what's called the black stone. The black stone. And the black stone is embedded in one of the corners of the Kaaba. And allegedly, when it fell from heaven, it was white. It's turned black because of the sins of men. Uh, you can see there's Muhammad Ali peering at the, uh, the black stone there. Um, when you go and do Hajj, uh, what you'd like to try to be able to do is you, you circumambulate the, the Kaaba seven times in the Grand Mosque. What you want to try to do is get close enough to the black stone to touch it or to kiss it. I can't imagine the biological <laughs> stuff that could be found on that black stone, but anyway. Um, and uh, I actually saw a couple years ago during Ramadan, I saw an um, uh, article by an engineer, a, uh, one who, a hydraulics engineer, as I recall, uh, who, who was basically explaining how you want to enter the mosque based upon flow dynamics to allow the crowd to get you as close to the black stone as possible. Because it, it's, just, it's just, the crowds are, are, are amazing. Uh, only a few years ago, I mean back in like 2006, over 4,000 people were trampled to death during Ramadan in one, in one season. They've done some major changes to, to stop that. But it was not uncommon uh, in, uh, in the past. And so what they're actually bowing toward is this, this black stone that you see there 
in, uh, embedded in the Kaaba. Now, there are also six articles of belief of Sunni Islam. Uh, there's belief in Allah, belief in all the prophets and messengers. Muhammad is the last, but there were many, many before him. I've heard as many as 100,000 were sent by Allah before that. Many of the biblical prophets are considered to be prophets and messengers from the Islamic perspective, including Jesus, who they believe to have been a Muslim. Uh, his, his disciples were Muslims as well. Uh, belief in the angels and the jinn. The jinn are, a, uh, are people, well not people, they are creatures made of smokeless fire. And there, there's really a, a parallel universe of jinn. I did not realize this for a number of years, but uh, at least Salafi Muslims, uh, the conservative Muslims, believe that there are Muslim jinn, Christian jinn, Jewish jinn. I can't imagine that there would be atheist jinn. Um, but um, the jinn um, are stronger than we are. They're faster than we are, but they're not as smart as we are, which sounds very much like a description of a teenager in a Camaro, personally to me. I don't know. Um, <laughs> strong, fast, not so smart. Yeah, that's, that's about right. Yeah, that's, that's how it works. But um, that's, uh, that's what the jinn are. And uh, if you remember, I dream of genie. That's where it comes from. Jinn, genie, that's, that's where it came from. Um, belief in the books... Kituvim, plural, sent by God, uh, which includes the Torah and the Injil, the law and the gospel. According to the Quran, as we are going to see, uh, the Torah, the law, and the gospel were sent down by God, and they contain light and guidance. Now, you need to understand, almost every single modern Muslim today believes that those books have been radically altered since they are originally given, and that's why they don't. That's why the Quran takes precedence over them, but we'll maybe have time to look at that a little bit later on. Belief in the Day of Judgment. Uh, there is far more discussion of the nature of hellfire uh, and eternal punishment in Islam than there is anywhere in, uh, in Christianity. It is truly amazing. The clarity and the description of these, uh, uh, these, these things. And uh, I, I may have time to narrate to you some of the hadith that illustrate that. And then belief in destiny or qadr. Now qadr can be rendered as predestination. Uh, there is a very strong uh, strain in Islam, very clearly found in the hadith and the Quran, that basically says that at 40 days of gestation, an angel comes and writes for each person whether it'll be a male or a female, now we all know that's a little bit late for that actually, but anyways, this is Muhammad, this is a long time ago. Male or female, successful, not successful, Muslim, non-Muslim, Christian, Jew, whatever they're going to be, rich, poor, long life, short life, day of their death, all of it is written down for them at 40 days during gestation. Um, and so everything is, is fixed, the day of your death is fixed, the day of your birth. And you might say, well, what's the difference between that and a strong view of God's sovereignty? The fundamental difference is that a law is so transcendent that there is no personal interaction of a law in regards to his decree and his interaction with human beings. I mean, Muslims just can't even begin to grasp what we believe is the truth in regards to the incarnation, for example that God would be so intimately and personally involved with his own creation. And so, from our perspective, God's sovereign decree includes his own personal interaction with his creation resulting in his own glory. That's very different than fatalism, which is really what you've got here where, you know, the, the, most, the most standard phrase we hear from most Muslims. Now, there are Western Muslims that are what we would call Arminian. <laughs> Uh, free will all the, all the way type of thing, but, but they have to interpret a lot of things in a rather intriguing way. But the most common phrase you'll hear amongst most Muslims around the world is, Inshallah, Inshallah, if God wills, if God wills. And in many countries, that, in many Muslim countries, in, in the, especially in the Middle East, people will tell you, you have a very difficult time getting anyone to work very hard. 
uh, the workday is rather short, and there's, it's just difficult because people say, inshallah, if God wills, I'll get to it, if God wills. And it's, it's, it has led to a, let's just say they don't exactly have a Puritan work ethic. Okay, uh, there's, there's, it, it causes a, causes a problem. That's not everybody, but, but it, is, it, it is there. Now, we're going to have to, again, do some listening here. I, again, apologize for the video. But um, this is from one of my debates. My, this is the first debate I do with a Muslim, but I was not studying Islam yet. So uh, I was defending the doctrine of the Trinity. And... Uh, this was from the audience questions. And this gives you an idea of a Muslim from a Muslim country who's come to the United States and how he has heard what I've said and what he considers to be a very strong, valid objection to Christianity. So listen to our, our interaction. And as you're listening, ask yourself the question, how would I respond to this Muslim. Now, you're going to hear my response. Of course, mine's a fairly brief one because it's audience questions. But ask yourself the question, how would I respond before you hear how I did respond uh, to this particular individual? Yes, my question to the doctor. I heard you repeating many times you saying he's a creator about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Be some blessing be upon him because we Muslim believe in Jesus, the mighty prophet of God. I heard you many times you saying he's the creator of everything and all things. So I want you to explain to me if it's possible if he's a creator of everything when Jesus be some blessing be upon him was he walking by the fig tree with his companion the fig tree with his companion and he wants to eat some fig and they told him master the fig is not in season so if he was god how he don't know if he create the tree how he know how he does he doesn't know if what's in season or what not in season if he create everything okay, okay. and if the fig was not in season and he's God. First of all, we don't accept God to be hungry. He wants to eat, but you, Christian, you said God chose to do so. So that's your faith. But I'm saying, even if you was God and fig is not in season, why he couldn't order the tree to bring fig? Okay, Isn't thank that you. God the one create everything? Okay, thank you. To the Dr. Doctor. White. He did so because the fig tree represented the people of Israel, and he made the application the people of Israel look like they have fruit, but they do not. It was a clear application that he made. Secondly, he did eat food because the word became flesh. He became hungry. He became tired. Because as the New Testament, as it was written, clearly indicates, Jesus Christ was the God-man. The eternal Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. He was a true man. He ate food. He became tired. He slept. He grew, etc., etc. Christians have always believed that. Why? Because we believe all the New Testament teaches. But okay, so I'm going to pop out for just a second uh, and see if maybe I can do something here that might fix things. Uh, let me let me see if. Yes, my question to the doctor. I heard you repeating many times you saying he's a creator about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Be some blessing be upon him because we Muslim so believe in there's, Jesus. There's, there's the, the line of people waiting to ask the questions. I heard you many times you saying he's the creator of everything and all things. Okay. It just while he was saying that, something crossed my mind that said, you know, when I plugged this in, it completely changed my video settings. So let's change vid the video output and see if it fixes it and so I apologize you didn't get to see some of the other um, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me actually do show you at least one here uh, so you can actually see the Kaaba and stuff Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca is compulsory for all Muslims in good health and with sufficient funds to make the journey the Hajj is the foremost of all Muslim rituals even if less than 10% of all Muslims ever managed to complete it. 
The Hajj's importance lies in its allowing the believer to approach the center of the world as well as the place where the Quran's divine revelations began and continued for about 12 years. The performer of Hajj does not only reenact Muhammad's ritual, he or she also recalls acts of important people in Muslim history. The rituals performed around the Kaaba reenacts when Prophet Abraham and Ishmael transformed the Kaaba into the sacred place of worship and peace. In spite of some physical hardships, pilgrims who complete the Hajj consider it one of the greatest spiritual experiences of their lives. Many Muslims regard the Hajj as one of the great achievements of civilization because it brings together people from around the world and focuses them upon a single goal. Okay, so there's that one, and then just so you have it in your mind, what it looked like, um, just a few seconds of this. Can you stand for me quickly? Just stand for me. Come right here, please. So there was uh, there was the uh, the shahada. So that's uh, at least you have an idea now what uh, what that was uh, that was all about. Now, going back just just briefly to um, the question that was that was asked, did you understand what his objection was? His objection was if Jesus is God, he could just say first of all he should have known when figs are in season, and secondly uh, he should have just been able to say to the fig tree bring forth figs. He's God; it'll come forth. And thirdly, God wouldn't be hungry anyways. Now, some of you are going, wow, I think the Jehovah's Witnesses are a little better than that. Uh, but those are, those are objections. We, we may chuckle at those objections, but that doesn't mean we're answering those objections. And from their perspective, those objections make perfect sense. Because God can't become a man. Allah would never do these things. God can never be hungry. And as we'll see, these are, actually, these are actually Quranic objections. They are objections found in the text of the Quran itself. Okay? So I'm going to show you a couple more uh, clips here. Then we'll take a, a brief break. Uh, not the full length we were going to take because we got started a little bit late. We'll take a brief break. I'm going to try to run through as, as much of this as I, as I can in the time that we have. Um, and we'll, I'm going to try to leave some room for some questions toward the end. Uh, but uh, this, this next clip that I want to show you is from my debate with Sheikh Jalal Abu Alrub. Uh, Sheikh Jalal is a Palestinian. And you just get the feeling that the term chip on the shoulder is somewhat descriptive at this particular point. Uh, let's take a look. The last Oops. Is there the last hour? This is only the father. You remember my opponent, he said that Christians don't consider Jesus the Father. Well, then he doesn't know about the last hour, because he's not divine. Oh, but he is in complete harmony with the Father. Really? One of them died, and the Holy Ghost and God had no idea what's going on. One of them died. No, the one who died is an addition, not a subtraction. Come on, people. Offer the creed the same way Abraham gave it to his people. Did he ever say anything like this? We are angry here. I was insulted twice here. The terrible stuff my opponent said about Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, taking stuff out of context and put, you know, using fabricated words. And secondly, calling a son to God is the greatest offense, offense to us Muslims. So don't think that you can come here and act you're angry because we are angry because Allah doesn't have a son. He told you so. Jesus never said, I am Lord, I'm divine, I'm the, I'm the God, the creator, worship me as you worship God. The Holy Ghost is God. Adam didn't say, Abraham didn't say, Noah didn't say, they must have known another God than you one, the one you know. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open your hearts and minds because Jesus said it in so many ways that he's not God. You just want to stick it to him no matter what. You just want to stick it to him no matter what. Um, that was a very interesting debate. It's all available on YouTube if you'd like to see the whole thing. Because I think 
It's a little bit more representative of the kind of encounter you'd have with most uh, street-level Muslims in regards to these uh, particular issues. But I don't want you to get the idea that the only objections to our, our, our beliefs from Muslims are like Sheikh Jalal or the fellow from the, uh, the initial debate. So this uh, next clip is from the debate that I did at Biola University in 2006. This really was my first serious Islamic debate. And this was with a man by the name of Shabir Ali. And uh, listen to this portion of our cross-examination period from uh, Biola University. There were about uh, 2,500 uh, students there uh, that evening. They found it to be a very interesting evening. Is there any way that you can give to us this evening to explain to us uh, how we can determine what is still inspired in the New Testament and what is not? Well, I believe that uh, Muslims have a simple answer to this in saying that whatever is in the Quran, uh, that would be a judge of whatever is there in, in the Bible. So whatever of the Bible agrees with the Quran, that obviously is inspired. What uh, is contradictory is obviously not from God. And that which is neutral, and neither in agreement nor in disagreement, uh, may be treated with some bit of silence. Usually the classical scholars have recommended silence, but I believe that uh, Muslims who are quite familiar with the Gospels and uh, familiar with the development uh, of the text over time can make some judgments, uh, though these judgments will be tentative. So everything about the cross, resurrection, atonement, deity of Christ, Jesus is the Son of God, the Holy Spirit is a divine person, not an angel, Gabriel, all of that stuff is, is uninspired and, and a corruption of the original intention of the New Testament in light of the Quran. A Muslim would say that uh, the Quranic revelation is here now as the pristine word of God. That teaches us that there is only one God, that Jesus is his uh, Messiah, but nevertheless a servant and messenger of the one true God. And so anything that is contrary to that, something that teaches, for example, uh, that human responsibility as described in the Quran is to be somehow evaded, um, that, that would be contrary and would be thought to be a later development. Now, of course, that could be studied from another angle. One can look at the history and development of Christian teaching over time. One can look at the Gospels uh, even without Islamic presuppositions. And it seems to me that uh, many uh, biblical scholars are coming to conclusions which are very close to the main conclusions which uh, Muslims insist on, that Jesus was uh, an apocalyptic uh, prophet like the prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, he preached uh, the belief in God, similar to the belief in the, uh, that was known uh, from the Jewish prophet, since he himself was Jewish, he lived in a Jewish milieu. You mean people so, like the Jesus Seminar, uh, John Dominic Cross and Marcus Borg. Uh, it doesn't have to be them. The scholars are so numerous, it'll be hard for us to list them and, and to, to name them now. So but is, there, is, there any, uh, is there any New Testament book uh, that Mark, for example, which you've referred to many times, Mark clearly identifies Jesus as the Son of God, puts words in his mouth that you would never be able to accept as a Muslim. Isn't that correct? Well, it is clear that even Mark uh, must have um, uh, suffered from a similar sort of phenomenon that we uh, describe in the case of Matthew. And John Bowden has made specifically that point in his book, Jesus, The Unanswered Questions. If we look at Mark chapter 1, verse 1, which in many Bibles begin the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it is noted in the NIV, for example, that the title, the Son of God, in this particular verse uh, is not found in some of the most ancient and reliable manuscripts. So I'm not saying that the gospel according to Mark does not present Jesus as the Son of God, but we have to be aware of scribal changes that have affected the gospel according to Mark in places as well. And uh, in fact, we are working with the gospel according to Mark only as it has come down to us. Knowing the history of scribal changes, uh, we would not be out of our grounds to wonder if in fact we do really have the original Mark and Gospel. Would you admit that you do not have any uh, hard manuscript evidence uh, from the first or second centuries that gives to us a New Testament that looks like a Muslim would expect it to look like? We do not have such a document. We do not have such a document was the last thing he said there. Now, very, very quickly, one last clip, since we're sort of running behind. Uh, had an excellent debate in, uh, in Sydney, Australia, at the University of New South Wales, uh, less than two years ago, with Abdullah Kunda. And we debate a subject that's vitally important, and that is, uh, can God become man, the incarnation? And here is a, is a portion of our interaction. Now, it's a little bit difficult to understand Abdullah. The sound wasn't real good, but he is, he is an Australian 
with somewhat of a German accent. So you put all that together and it's very, very interesting. Uh, but um, here's uh, just a portion of, of that interaction that I would really, if you want to lis listen to a debate online, this is one I would recommend that you listen to or watch uh, on, uh, on YouTube. Mr. Kunda, I, I think we have to really focus uh, when, when, when I say the central question is this and your response is that I have diminished capacity, I think we're talking past each other somehow at this point. <laughs> so let's look at that question again. I ask the question, does God as creator have the power, ability, or capacity to join a human nature to himself if he pleases to do so? Now, did I understand in your rebuttal that you liken that to, can God create another God? Yeah, that's, that's great. That's what I'm wanted to do. Or, or any of the other theological uh, fallacies that I mentioned. Okay, can you explain how that question involves a logical fallacy? Well, it, from a Muslim perspective, obviously not from a Christian perspective, but from a Muslim perspective, as I said, uh, God has certain attributes which we consider are uh, essential and which only apply to him. So, for example, without a beginning and without an end uh, are two of these attributes. Now, these are not possessed by anything else in creation. They're only possessed by God. So, we say that for God, or even if we were to entertain the argument that there's three persons of God, for, for one of those persons who is apparently co-eternal and, and co-equal with the other two, to then give up one of these essential attributes for us would be an illogical fallacy. Because for us, by definition, if God doesn't have one of these attributes, he's not God. What essential attribute do you see the question assuming when it says, does God as creator have the power or ability or capacity to join a human nature to himself if he pleases to do so? What, what essential element is being abandoned? Well, all of them. Because uh, human nature, by definition, we're um, dependent upon things. I'm dependent upon three dimensions of space that I exist in. I'm dependent upon time. I'm dependent upon sustenance. So it immediately um, removes him from being self-subsistent. Uh, I do not have independent knowledge. I acquire my knowledge from other people or from books, etc. Uh, so it denies him having knowledge. I'm, you know, I cannot see beyond the walls of this building. So it denies him having universal sight. So on and so on. So, uh, it was a very, very, very interesting encounter. It really helps to understand the mindset of uh, a very bright young Muslim. He's one of the few Muslims that I've, I sent in my book on the Trinity. He actually read it and attempted to uh, alter his arguments to respond to what I said in my book. You, and you need to understand that's extremely rare. Uh, most Muslims just do not do that. Uh, they have a set of arguments, and whether they actually, that actually interacts with what we believe or not is, is a completely different uh, issue. Uh, but Abdullah is, um, Abdullah has twice now, when I've contacted him, when I've been teaching classes on Islam, been willing to get up at an outrageous time there in Australia to join my class on Skype. And I've had my students in my class asking him questions and interacting with him on video. Uh, uh, from Australia, so he's, uh, he's a, a real nice young man and, and I hope to have more debates with him and more encounters with him in the future. Just got hold of, uh, that'll help get me through this section anyways. The, the uh, insulin won't really kick in for about 20 minutes after that. I make no guarantees as to the orthodoxy of anything I have to say. But uh, anyway, now let's get back to it. We only have uh, a certain amount of time and I do want to get to at least some questions. Hopefully I'll, I'll cover a lot of them. Um, Surah 112 is about as close as you're going to get in the Quran to a statement of a, a creed type, a creedal type statement. Um, since most of you have not read the Quran, let me just mention, by the way, it's about 57% the length of the New Testament. Um, so it's not a long book. It was allegedly written between 610 and 632 AD. So it comes over half a millennium after the Bible. And hence, uh, 
uh, after the time of Christ anyways. Uh, it makes reference to both the Old and New Testament and directly addresses you. We are called the Al Al-Kitab, the people of the book, or Al Al-Injil, the people of the gospel, in the text of the Quran. And we will be looking at some of the things that the Quran says to you and me uh, here in the next uh, few moments. By the way, if you ever choose to read the Quran, which I would recommend that you do if you're going to be talking to Muslims, obviously, if you go to Utah to do missions, you need to read the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants for your price. If you go to Brooklyn, you need to know something about Jehovah's Witnesses, read some of their literature. If you could talk to Muslims, it is always very helpful um, to know something about what they believe and to have read some of their materials. Obviously, when someone approaches you and they want to talk to you, and you go, have you ever read the Bible? And they've never read the Bible? Their level of credibility of critique of your faith is much lower than it would be otherwise. Same thing in reverse. We can't expect them to give us much credit if we haven't taken the time to know what they believe. When I talk to a Muslim and I let them know that I've read the Quran multiple times, that I've actually translated portions of the Quran from Arabic, in Arabic, and that I have read Sahih Bukhari, almost finished with Sahih Muslim, the Muad of Malik, all the Hadith Qudsi, uh, that's about at that point, their jaws drop open because most of them have never done anything even close to that. Most of their imams have not done that much reading. Um, and so they're just like, you're kidding me. Um, and that opens tremendous doors because to them, they, they take that as a, as a sign of respect and it gives me at least some opportunity to say something. So if you ever get a Quran, there are some bad translations of the Quran. In fact, I would say the most common translations are generally not the best. Uh, it's just because the Saudi Arabian government prints, prints them by the millions. But the most common one out there is by Yusuf Ali. Not the best one to get. Um, probably the easiest one, that, the two that you can get that are easiest to get hold of, they're very conservative, are the, um, the Sahi translation and the um, um, uh, Hilali Khan translation. Um, you can get others like Pictal and others that are available in most of your bookstores. Uh, just be aware that translations vary in their, in their quality. Now, there's only 114 surahs. If you buy one, whatever you do, do not start with surah 1, then read surah 2, then read surah 3, because you're going to have no idea what in the world's going on. Because the Quran is ordered, the surahs are put in the order of their length. So surah 1, sur, uh, surah al-Fatiha is an opening prayer, then surah 2, surah al-Baqarah is, is the longest surah then Surah 3 is a little bit shorter. Surah 4 is a little bit shorter. So it gets shorter, 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 shorter as it goes through the... But the problem was they weren't written in that order. So if you read it that way, you're bouncing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth from different periods in Muhammad's life. And even if you know what the background is, you're not going to be able to follow any type of context at all. So if you're going to read it, uh, pick up my book uh, and write toward the, uh, the front of the book somewhere. Uh, well, actually, maybe not toward the front of the book. I only wrote it. I don't know where anything is in it. Um, yeah, there it is. Oh, great. They split into two pages. Lovely. Um, here on two pages is a chart. It is also on my website. If you look up the word chronological on my blog, this will come up. Uh, but this gives you the best guess we have of the chronological order of the 114 surahs. So at least if you read it following that, you're sort of following Muhammad's life a little bit, and it makes it a little bit easier to understand what's going on in the Quran uh, itself at that particular point in time. So Surah 112 is right at the end of the, of the Quran, and you're seeing all of it. This is, this is all of Surah 112. Say he is Allah, the one and only, Allah, the eternal absolute. Lem yelid wa lem yulid. He begetteth not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto him. Uh, most Muslim Muslims who engage in apologetics, which they call dawah, um, can quote this in, in, in Arabic. Um, I'm pretty close to being able to quote it in Arabic myself, but I frequently stumble on it, so I won't bother this morning. But uh, this is really uh, as close as you'll get to a, a, a creedal statement. And as you're looking at it, you'll notice that we can agree with a lot of what it says. Uh, God is the one and only. God is the eternal absolute. There is none like unto him. I mean, how many times is that said in Isaiah and Jeremiah and books like that in the Bible? It's said very frequently. But you'll notice the third ayah. By the way, uh, the, the chapters of the Quran are called surahs. That's why this is surah 112. And the verses are called ayah or ayat. Ayat is a plural. Look at the third ayah. He begetteth not, nor is he begotten. Lem yelid wa lem yulid. Now, Arabic is a Semitic language, hence it has the same roots as Hebrew. 
one of the reasons I've survived with the minimal amount of Arabic training that I've actually received is because I've taught Hebrew in the past. And so my knowledge of Arabic is actually Arabic prompt, propped up by Hebrew, since there, a lot of the grammar and the uh, roots are, are very similar. And when we have in Isaiah chapter 9, for example, uh, a child will be born to us. The root there is yalad. A yelad will be yaladed to us. And here you have the same thing in Surah 3. Lem yelad walem yulad. He begetteth not, nor is he begotten. I took one of my classes uh, to the mosque at Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. And we met with the imam after the prayers. And, and I asked him, I said, uh, would you think that the third ayah of Surah Al-Iklas, Al-Iklas, by the way, means purity uh, or sincerity, uh, the, third, the third ayah is in reference to the Christian belief that Jesus is the Son of God. And he said, oh, there's, there's no question about that. That's exactly what it's referring to. What's important about this is if this is about as close as you can get to a creedal statement defining Islam, then one quarter of this creedal statement is a denial of what you and I believe. Islam comes after us, it interacts with us, and specifically identifies our belief in three, or the idea that God has a son as a heinous sin. And so you need to understand that because it's one of the great barriers that we have in presenting the gospel. For example, I mentioned to you earlier <clears throat> the sin of shirk. Shirk is association of anyone or anything with Allah. So in Surah 31, 13, O my son, do not associate anything with Allah. Indeed, association with him is great injustice. The underlying text there is shirk. Uh, in Surah 6, 1, all praise is due to Allah who created the heavens and the earth and made the darkness and the light then those who disbelieve, the kafirs, which is frequently what we're referred to, equate others with their Lord, the sin of shirk. And so these are warned against, and one of the great barriers that you and I have in presenting the gospel to Muslims is that they believe that we are, in essence, because of our worship of Jesus Christ, uh, calling them to commit the one sin that if they commit that sin, they can never be forgiven. In fact, uh, Muhammad asked Allah for the right to intercede for his parents. His parents died uh, while he was, while, b before he became a prophet in his youth, and so they died as mushrikim, committers of shirk. They're idolaters. And so he asked Allah if he could pray for his parents, and Allah said, no, you cannot. You cannot pray for someone who dies on the sin of shirk. One exception was granted to him in the entirety of his lifetime. His uncle Abu Talib protected him while he was a minority prophet in Mecca. From 610 to 622, he was preaching in Mecca, had a small number of followers, uh, was a really unpopular guy because his family, the Quraysh tribe, uh, had control of the Kaaba and a lot of their money came from the idol trade. And so you come along preaching there's only one God, the idols are not true, true gods, uh, you're, you're not exactly a popular guy. And so the story is that Muhammad was mistreated. There was once when he was bowing in prayer and prostration to Allah, and some of his enemies came along and dropped a uh, she-camel uterus on his back um, and mocked him. And he just stayed in that position until his daughter Fatima came along and removed it from his back. And, of course, the story goes on to say that uh, their bodies were all thrown into a well when they died at the Battle of Badr, so they all, they all died for what they did. But anyway, uh, there was mistreatment between 610 and 622. Then in 622, you have the Hijra, where Muhammad leaves Mecca, goes to Medina, and that's where the Islamic calendar actually starts, is in the Hijra of 622. Anyway, during that first period of time, Abu Talib, his uncle, protects him. But he does not become a Muslim. He does not say the Shahada. And on his deathbed, Muhammad comes to him and he says, Say la ilaha illallah. Uh, you, you know that this is true. And at the, at the rest of the family is saying, Don't you dare abandon the ancestral gods, etc., etc. Well, he dies as a mushrik. He does not make profession of faith. But Allah does grant Muhammad the right to intercede for Abu Talib. Only, only exception. The result of Muhammad's intercession for Abu Talib is that Abu Talib has the best spot in hell. 
the best spot in hell. And you're all sitting here going, so what is the best spot in hell? D describe the garden spot of hell for us. Uh, well, according to Muhammad's description, he is wearing a pair of sandals that are so hot his brains boil. That's the best place in, uh, in hell. Uh, other versions of that story is he's standing in fire only up to his ankles, but it's so hot that his brains boil, and that's the best place. So all the rest of us, a whole lot worse than that. So that's, uh, that's how bad shirk is, uh, just to give you an illustration from the life of Abu Talib. Surahs 4, 5, and 6. Well, really, surahs 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. The longest and probably the most uh, relevant to us as Christians. Uh, most of the lengthy conversations about us are found in these particular surahs, especially surahs 4 and 5. Surah 4, ayahs 47 and 48. O you who were given the scripture, that is the al kitab the people of the book, believe in what we have sent down to Muhammad, confirming that which is with you, before we obliterate faces and turn them towards their backs or curse them as we curse the Sabbath breakers. And ever is the decree of Allah accomplished. Indeed, Allah does not forgive association with him, but he forgives what is less than that for whom he wills. And he who associates others with Allah has certainly fabricated tremendous sin. So there is the specific statement from the Quran, shirk will not be forgiven. Uh, Allah does not forgive association with him. So if a Muslim believes that you and I are mushriks, that we are mushrikim, then there is no hope for us unless we become Muslims. If we die as Christians, uh, there, is, there is absolutely no hope for us. That is what most Muslims believe, but not all. Uh, Hamza Yusuf, for example, one of the best known Muslim leaders in the United States, does not believe that Christians are mushrikim. His argumentation is that because Muslim men are allowed to marry Christian women, and a mushrik is nejes, he, is, uh, he or she is despicable to God, that would never be allowed to happen. So Christians can't be mushrikim. But the vast majority of Muslims point out, yeah, but the Quran specifically teaches that to say three uh, is to engage in shirk. And it is kufr, it is unbelief. So there is, the majority of Muslims do believe that we are, we are committing the sin of shirk and that therefore you are inviting them to commit the sin of shirk when you call them to faith in Jesus Christ. Surah 4, 171 through 172 says, O people of the scripture, again, al kitab people of the book, do not commit excess to alu in your religion or say about Allah except the truth. So you need to understand the Quran says to us that we have committed excess. We have been given the truth. The the the. The Torah contains light and guidance. Uh, the gospel contains light and guidance. It was natsal. It was sent down by Allah. It, it's divine revelation. But we have committed excess in our deen, in our religion. And we are saying about Allah things other than the truth. We've gone beyond what we needed to say. The Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, was but a messenger of Allah. He was a razul of Allah, and his word which he directed to Mary, and a soul created a command from him, so believe in Allah and his messengers. So Muslims do believe that Jesus was virgin born. They believe that Allah simply said, be, and he was. In fact, Muslims believe that Jesus performed more miracles than you and I believe he did. Because the Quran actually narrates miracles that Jesus did not perform in the canonical Gospels, but that he did perform in the later Gnostic Gospels. And so, for example, uh, the Quran repeats the story uh, of Jesus forming little clay birds and then breathing on them, and they become living birds and fly away. Now, that comes from the infancy Gospel of Thomas, a Gnostic Gospel, uh, that is not one of the canonical Gospels and does not go to the actual time frame of Jesus' life. But the Quran accepts that as a, as a reality. Um, so they do believe, uh, the vast majority of Muslims believe Jesus is sinless, that he was a prophet, that he committed miracles, 
and all these things, but he was not the Son of God, and he was only the Jewish Messiah. He was not a Messiah for anyone outside of the Jewish people themselves. Okay? So um, there you have 4, 171. It continues on. And do not say three. Now, one of the ways you can sort of test a translation, if you're looking at a translation of the Quran, maybe you're in a bookstore or something like that, write this number down, sort of 4, 171, 172, and then look at it. And if it says, do not say Trinity, probably not a good translation. Now, I think it's what the Quran's talking about. It's trying to address the Trinity. But the actual Arabic word is three. The, the specific word for three is not found. Uh, in a, a spe- specific word for Trinity is not found in the Quran. The word for three is. Do not say three. Desist. It is better for you. Indeed, Allah is but one God. Now, please note something. Anytime the Quran says something like three, within the next sentence, it will then say, Allah is but one God. So if every time it says three, the next sentence is, there's only one God, what is the author thinking the three is? Three gods. Very clearly. Do not say three, desist, it is better for you. Indeed, Allah is but one God. Exalted is he above having a son. Now, most Muslims believe that when we talk about Jesus, the son of God, we are actually saying that God got married and had a kid. Because that's what, clearly, the Quran thinks it was. And that's what the the relationship of God and his sons in the uh, pagan religions were. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth, and sufficient as Allah is disposed of affairs. Never would the Messiah disdain to be a servant of Allah, nor would the angels near to him, and whoever disdains his worship and is arrogant, he will gather them to himself altogether. So here you're you're seeing the, the Quran arguing against what its author thinks is the doctrine of the Trinity. And the doctrine of the Trinity means that the Messiah would never have been a servant of Allah. Well, of course, we believe that the Messiah was servant of Allah. He's the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. It's not even an issue. Obviously, to me, one of the greatest evidences that the Quran is not the word of God is the fact that its author had no earthly idea what he was talking about when he criticized the doctrine of the Trinity. And since Muslims believe that the Quran is, the, the Quran are the very words of Allah, one of the really hard things to understand, and I'm, I'm going into way too much depth here, but I'm, let me just mention this to you in passing. Uh, one of the things you've got to understand is from the Islamic perspective, Muhammad has nothing to do with the Quran. What Muhammad understood has nothing to do with the Quran. These, the Quran is as eternal as Allah. It's uncreated. It's his very words. And therefore, what Muhammad understood, didn't understand, grew an understanding of irrelevant It's simply dictated by the angel Jibreel to Muhammad, and he repeats it, and that's it. His understanding has no place anywhere in the Quran. And so, as a result, it's just unquestionable in their mind. You can't read it in chronological order and go, wow, it looks like Muhammad was developing this here. No, 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 no. Well, if that's the case, I have a simple question to ask of a Muslim. Did Allah know what the Trinity was in 632 A.D.? Even if the Trinity is false, Allah knew what it was. He could have criticized it devastatingly, but he doesn't. He doesn't understand it, doesn't criticize it. So very clearly, the Quran cannot be the word of God uh, because its author clearly does not understand what it is he is addressing because he misrepresents it. And we'll see that even more so in just a moment here in Surah 5. Surah 5, Ayahs 72 to 77 say, they have certainly disbelieved. They are coffers who say, Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary. Now, that's not how we talk, by the way. We don't say God is Christ. We talk about the deity of Christ. But when you say Allah is Christ, you're sort of saying that all of God is the Messiah. No. The Father didn't become incarnate. The Spirit didn't become incarnate. It was the Son who became incarnate. Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary, while the Messiah has said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord, and your Lord. Now, before you start going to your concordance to try to find out where Jesus said that, uh, the name Jesus appears 25 times in the Quran. 
Uh, Jesus is quoted a number of times in the Quran. Ironically, only once in the Quran is Jesus ever quoted in a physical location. Other than that, he's just a disembodied voice that just sort of floats around and, and says he's not God and says Muhammad's a prophet, basically. The one place that he speaks from identifiable location is from his cradle. Another instance where uh, you have a story that developed amongst Christians long after the Gospels is accepted by the Quran as if it was actually historical. This is from the Arabic infancy gospel, which really wasn't even written until the 5th century. So this is a story that was only about 100, 200 years old at the time that the Quran picks it up and incorporates it uh, uncritically. So here you have Jesus saying, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Indeed, he who associates others with Allah, shirk, Allah has forbidden him paradise, and his refuge is the fire. And there are not for the wrongdoers any helpers. They have certainly disbelieved who say, Allah is the third of three, and there is no God except one God. So notice again, there's the word three, and what's the very next sentence? Only one God. Only one God. Very clearly, the author thinks that we believe that we are polytheists. We believe in multiple gods. And the vast majority of Muslims that I've talked to also believe that. Now, obviously, I talk to some of the best trained Muslims in the world who know, who know other than that. But I also have done street ministry in London, where we'll go out uh, and we'll go to uh, Leicester Square. Beautiful, beautiful place. Anybody ever been to Leicester Square? Just amazing, an amazing place. And uh, somebody will get up and start street, street preaching. The Muslims will flock to us, and they send them over to me, and we'll have these long conversations. And the vast majority of those Muslims believe that we are polytheists, that we believe in three separate gods. But it is said here to be an act of disbelief to say Allah is the third of three. Well, does the, does the Quran ever say who the three are? Keep that in mind. Surah 5 continues on saying, If they do not desist from what they are saying, there will surely afflict the disbelievers among them a painful punishment. So will they not repent to Allah and seek His forgiveness? And Allah is forgiving and merciful. The Messiah, son of Mary, was not but a messenger. Other messengers have passed on before him. And his mother was a supporter of truth. They both used to eat food. Look how we make clear to them the signs, then look how they are deluded. Now, did you catch something? Why did Mary end up in there? Well, Mary was, uh, Mary was a supporter of truth. And in fact, Mary is the only woman named by name in the Quran. She has an entire chapter named after her, Surah 19, Surah Tamariam. She's the only woman named in the Quran. But why say they both used to eat food? It should sound familiar. This is the fig tree argument, which we heard earlier and saw briefly once I got the video fixed. This is where the guy from the other country got the, the argument. They both used to eat food. If you eat food, you're not a god, but it mentions Mary. Now, I recognize Roman Catholicism has exalted Mary a long ways, but even Rome will say, well, she's not god. Keep that in mind because... I think it's important, we'll see in a moment. And notice it says that we are deluded. I mean, it's amazing how many times I hear people saying, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't preach anything that would offend the Muslims. Well, have you read the Quran recently? <laughs> you know, I mean, deluded, going to hell, uh, mm, okay. Say, do you worship besides a law that which holds for you no power of harm or benefit while it is a law who is the hearing and knowing? Say, O people of the scripture, again, that's us, do not exceed limits in your religion, do not commit excess, Beyond the truth, and do not follow the inclinations of a people who had gone astray before and misled many and have strayed from the soundness of the way. The opening prayer of the Quran um, is repeated so often because it's a part of the regular prayers that my Arabic tutor could quote it, even though he's always raised as a Christian. And at the end of Surat al Fatiha, it says it, it's a prayer to God to be led in the path of those who've earned your grace. Not those who have earned your anger or those who have gone astray. And when Muhammad was asked in the Hadith, who has earned Allah's anger and who has gone astray, his consistent answer was, those who've earned God's anger are the Jews. Those who've earned, who have gone astray from God are the Christians. So every Muslim, every day, multiple times prays, don't let me be a Jew or a Christian sort of another barrier of things. Notice here, inclinations of people who had gone astray 
before and misled many and have strayed from the soundness of the way. That's describing us. We have committed excess by exalting Jesus. And that is clearly the perspective of the Quran. Now, notice what the Quran says in a number of different places, then we're going to tie this together and I'm going to have to speed up even more. Had Allah wished to take himself a son, he could have chosen whom he pleased out of those whom he created. But God be to him, glory be to him, he is above such things. He is Allah, the one, the irresistible. Had Allah wished to take to himself a son, what's the relationship here in the mind of the author of the Quran? Well, Surah 6101 says, To him is due the primal origin of the heavens and the earth. How can he have a son when he hath no consort? I asked my Arabic tutor, consort. What the, we looked at the term. He says, well, in, in modern Arabic, that's sort of the woman on the side. But obviously the idea is of some type of a mate, a wife. So we go back to Surah 5 and notice what it says in Surah 5, 116. And beware of the day, this is the day of judgment, when Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as deities besides Allah? He will say, exalted are you. It was not for me to say that to which I have no right. If I had said it, you would have known it. You know what is within myself, and I do not know what is within yourself. Indeed, it is you who is the knower of the unseen. This is the only place in the Quran where the three are identified. Did you say to the people, take me, so did you say to the people, take me, there's one, and my mother, two, as deities besides Allah, three. There's your three. Allah, Mary is Mary, and they have a kid named Jesus. Now, that ain't the Trinity. And God knew that in the seventh century. But Muhammad, how would he know? I mean, he's raised in Mecca. There's almost no Christian representation there at all. And he's part of the Quraysh tribe. And they're in charge of the Kaaba. He may have gone, he, he went on, on caravan up into Syria. He may have looked into a, a small Christian church in a village in Syria. What would he have seen around the year 600, 590, in a small church in Syria? He would have seen statuary maybe uh, of God as creator, would have seen crucifixes, Jesus on a cross. He might have seen a dove, but would that have struck him as a sign of deity? No. But what else would he have seen? He would have seen a woman, a woman with a baby in her arms. So you've got God the creator, you've got a woman with a baby, and then you've got Jesus on the cross. Must be what the Trinity is. Ends up in the Quran. Now, when Jesus is forced to say, if I had said it, you would have known it, you know what is within myself, and I do not know what is within yourself. That's offensive to me. It's offensive to me. That's not what my Jesus said. And I wish at some point in his life, someone had explained to Muhammad, at least earlier in his life, what Jesus did say in Matthew eleven twenty seven: 27, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Now that goes back to the first century, not to the sixth century, like Muhammad's views do. We need to keep that in mind. Now, very quickly, the three barriers you have to get over in talking to Muslims, we've already seen the first one is shirk. The second one we're not going to have time to really get into, but I, I do spend a lot of time discussing in the book, which we have none of them for you to purchase, um, is uh, 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 you can get them from Alpha and Omega. We actually, Amazon isn't even shipping yet. We actually have them, so uh, Amazon isn't shipping yet. Um, the second one is the fact they believe that our scriptures are corrupted. And the third is this denial of the crucifixion. Surah 4, 157. Surah 4, 157. And for their saying, indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it was made to appear to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption. And they did not kill him for certain. The next ayah says, rather, Allah raised him up, Rafahu, to himself, and ever is Allah exalted in might 
and wise. So there is the one ayah in all of the Quran that denies the crucifixion. If that wasn't in the Quran, there are other references, Surah 355, Surah 1933, that would naturally refer to the death of Jesus. But because of these 40 Arabic words, anyone seen uh, the video that we co-produced uh, with uh, Ivy? Uh, a, it's a spoken word video uh, called 40 Arabic Words. We actually, it's not rap, but it's called spoken word, which is sort of similar to, but a little bit different from. Uh, we actually uh, produced this, I co-wrote co the, uh, uh, the words uh, called 40 Arabic Words, where we talk about this section and compare it with uh, Galatians chapter 2. And um, maybe we can play that later on or something, and uh, you'll find it rather interesting. We've actually done a few uh, music videos like that. Anyway, for the vast majority of Muslims in the world, outside of westernized Muslims, this is what they believe this text is saying. They did not kill him. This is talking about the Jews, by the way. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But it was made to appear to them. Should be halaham. They understand that to mean that someone else was made to look like Jesus. And someone else then was put on the cross. Now, who would be the most logical culprit? Judas. So most Muslims in the world think that Judas was the one who was put on the cross. That Jesus was taken up by Allah to heaven and Judas was crucified, which was a proper a punishment for his betrayal of Jesus. Now, I had a Muslim send me a big, long article once proving beyond a shadow of a doubt with bold, underlined words in blue and red, which proves things, by the way. If you ever really want to prove things, you, you bold words and underline them and put them in blue and red, and that just means you've got the truth. There's just no question about it. Um, at least on the internet, that's how it works. Uh, but uh, prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Simon the Cyrene was the one who was crucified. But Jesus was not. You can, I had a friend who went on a missions trip to Uganda and had people coming out of huts in, in the jungles of Uganda uh, going, I just understand why you Christians believe that Allah would allow one of his greatest uh, messengers and most beloved prophets to die in such an ignoble way. That's why you have to emphasize, have to emphasize the voluntary nature of the sacrifice of Christ when talking to Muslims. You just have to do it. Just have to do it. Now I know, I know as I said, this is primarily amongst non-Westernized Muslims. Here in the United States, if Muslims have been here for a little while, frequently they'll go Allahu Alam Allahu alam in Arabic means God knows. The majority believe what's called the substitution theory that someone was substituted for Jesus. But here in the United States and in Western countries, they're not so quick to assert that. Why? Well, think about it for just a second. If Allah substituted somebody for Jesus, then in reality, Allah started Christianity by mistake. I mean, he did such a good job that even Jesus' followers went out and started proclaiming the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and started Christianity. So Christianity then results in all this shirk. And so Allah did such a great job that he started Christianity by mistake. And so they'll go, Allahu Alam, God knows, rather than actually uh, asserting the concept of substitution. Now, uh, uh, Yusuf Ali, in his uh, commentary on the Quran, says, The Orthodox Christian churches make it a cardinal point of their doctrine that his life was taken on the cross, that he died and was buried. And on the third day he rose in the body with his wounds intact and walked about and conversed and ate with his disciples and was afterwards taken up bodily to heaven. This is necessary for the theological doctrine of blood sacrifice and vicarious atonement for sins, which is rejected by Islam. You need to understand that the Muslims reject... Uh, the concept of the necessity of sacrifice to the forgiveness of sins. Allah can simply say, it's forgiven. That's it. Uh, there is no need for vicarious atonement. The Quranic teaching is that Christ was not crucified nor killed by the Jews. I love this phraseology. Notwithstanding certain apparent circumstances which produced that illusion in the minds of some of his enemies. Uh, yeah, and all of his friends too. 
Um, I just recently uh, debated uh, last September in London uh, a Muslim on the subject of Surah 4 and the crucifixion of Jesus. It's available on YouTube uh, if you want to uh, take a look at that. Now, let me uh, narrate to you uh, one hadith and then we'll, we'll close. First of all, just to the ladies in the room, uh, I wanted to get, show you this hadith. I was shown the hellfire and that the majority of its dwellers are women. Just thought I would throw that in there for the fun of it. Um, always wakes the ladies up. Um, would, would, would any of you ladies like to know why you said that? Because I can tell you. Um, and given that I have spent many hours of my life over the past few years learning the Hadith, I just like telling people about it because otherwise I really wasted all that time. Um, actually, the reason that he said this was because the women asked him, messenger of Allah, why? And he says, well, is it not the case that your testimony is worth only half of that of a man in the law court? And is it not the case that during your monthly period you cannot pray? Uh, therefore, you have deficiencies that then result in the majority of you being in hellfire. And of course, if I were a Muslim woman, I wouldn't last very long, but if I were a Muslim woman, my immediate response would be, but those are your rules. <laughs> I didn't make those rules up, but of course, in their perspective, yes, actually, God did. So that's, uh, that's the reason for it. Let me tell you a, uh, a story. Here's just the beginning of it on the screen, but I'll tell it to you and then show you one thing, and then we're done and take just a few minutes worth of questions. Um, Muhammad told the story, and by the way, I, I, I told this story as an example for years before I did a debate with uh, the imam of the largest uh, mosque in uh, New York. And we did a radio show before we did the debate, and he told this story before I did. So I'm not, I'm not cherry-picking this story. This is one that Muslims themselves tell. As an example, he told us an example of the, of the mercifulness of Allah. There was a Jewish man who killed 99 people, and he went to a priest and asked, will Allah accept my repentance? And the priest said, no, he will not, and so he killed the priest, and now he's murdered 100 people. And so he goes to a scholar, and I don't know if the scholar knew about the priest or not, but uh, he asked the scholar, uh, will Allah accept my repentance? And the scholar said, go to such and such a city, and the people there are very righteous, and they will instruct you as to how to make your repentance so it's acceptable to Allah. As he's going to the city, the time of his death comes, because remember, the date, moment of your death is basically stamped on your forehead the day that you are born. So he falls over dead and is lying there. And when you die, an angel from the hellfire comes and an angel from paradise comes to argue over your soul. Now you would think in this situation, the angel from the hellfire has got a slam dunk, okay? You know, uh, he's killed 100 people. He hasn't repented. He's never said the shahada. Um, he's going to hellfire. But the angel from paradise was probably trained at a better legal college, I guess. And, and he says, but he was going to find out about repentance. It sounds like an attorney. And so they end up having to take the case to any attorneys here. I'm not sure. I'd, I'm, no offense, but you're easy to play with. But um, anyway, uh, which is why my ministry never gets big donations from the t attorneys, I guess. But uh, so a law decrees that if the man is one cubit closer to the city he was going to than the city he came from, that he will go to paradise. And then Allah makes the earth to shrink between the man and that city. So when it's measured, he's one cubit closer, and the mass murderer went to paradise. Now, you think about that, and you go, well, okay. If that's in the Hadith, then a Muslim who's doing the five daily prayers, and said the Shahada, and giving zakat, and, and doing the fasting during the month of Ramadan, and, and uh, has gone on Hajj, and they got their shoe in, right? No. No. There is an arbitrariness with a law that I think is ironically reflected in the life of Muhammad himself. And aside from, you know, the majority of the dwellers of Hellfire are women, here is a video. There's no sound, so don't worry about it. June 30th, 2007, Glasgow Airport. There is a 
Jeep Cherokee on fire in that door. Two men drove that vehicle into the door. Uh, these are the gates inside. You can see people start running as they are evacuating from the building. They had filled the vehicle with gas cans and had rigged them to explode. Their idea was they were going to press this button and this massive wall of, of burning gas would be spewed all over those people and they would all die. Only two people died in the attack and they were the two people in the vehicle. And they actually died rather slowly from their burns over the next month or so. Horrible way to go. Now, one of the reasons that that catches my attention particularly is that I have walked through that door many times. I minister in a church, the Reformed Baptist Church of Annie's Land, which is one of the suburbs of Glasgow. Uh, Pastor Jim Handyside lives in that area. He's picked me up standing outside of that very spot. So when you see places that you've been, you have friends in that area, um, it sort of strikes you. And I was, I was there just a couple of years ago again. It's all fixed, obviously, now, but um, it, it, it certainly strikes you. But the other thing to think about is the fact that when we think about the two men in that vehicle, what motivated them? What motivated them? We tend to think they, they may have been down and outers. We know that Saudi Arabia and, and other places have paid martyrs to kill themselves on the straight streets of Israel and that kind of thing. So maybe they were down and outers trying to get some money for their families or something like that. Take questions later. But the reality is that these two men were National Health Service physicians. They were doctors, both of them, who planned this, drove that vehicle into that door, and then pressed a button, probably screaming, Allahu Akbar. Why? Because there is only one thing offered in the Quran, one way that you can know that you will be accepted by Allah and enter into paradise, and that is if you die in the state of jihad. Even Muhammad's companions did not have absolute certainty of their relationship to Allah. So you have in Islam a holy God, you have a law, you have sin, you have hellfire, and the one thing they need, they have been denied, and that is a mediator. The very thing we have in Christianity, and the author of the Quran did not understand. By denying who Jesus is, the Muslim is left with a holy God, with punishment of sin, and yet it's all left upon the individual as to whether they are going to be right with Allah. That is the great tragedy. And that, of course, is the great message that we have for the Muslims, is that there is a mediator and there is a way of peace with him. Now, we've gone past our time. Um, time for just a couple of questions. And uh, then we need to take our, our lunch break.